Hello. <laughs> All right, um, so our speaker today is Nick Kaiser. He's a colleague of mine from the biology, Department of Biology, and uh, he's a professor in biology, and he received his uh, PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, and from there uh, went to Rice University, where he had a postdoc for a couple of years, and um, came to the University of Florida in 2018. Uh, Nick teaches animal behavior and a graduate seminar in animal behavior and a course on behavior and disease, which is obviously the topic of today. And, um, oh, he also teaches introductory biology, <laughs> which is why he is our last speaker, because he wanted to wait until he was done with that for the semester. And uh, he has an active group of graduate students studying infectious disease ecology and behavior. And he focuses on how individual differences in host behavior alter patterns of infection in social groups, like social spiders. But I think he'll talk about other things today. So Nick, please. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jane. And it has the volume level. Pretty good, okay. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. It's, it's, an, honor be, it's an honor to be here. I'm excited to uh, share some of the stuff that I'm passionate about studying with you all. Okay, so the behavior of sick animals uh, might sound like you're hearing a presentation from a medical doctor or a veterinarian or something like that. And I am neither of those things. Uh, I'm, you know, I approach this research as an animal behaviorist, as an ecologist. So I think you'll see sort of the context in which we address some of these questions. So when we think about the parasites that affect wild animals, you know, we usually think about a specific host, if we're talking about some ungulate like a deer or, a, or something like that, and the parasites that affect it. And, you know, you can study things like pathology or epidemiology or, you know, population biology, how many deer are there when there's a disease present or how many parasites are there when there's this number of deer, you know, hard number, things like that. But I think we often overlook the the behavioral aspects of this, right? A lot of infectious diseases are driven by behavior. We are all very familiar with this after the past couple of years, right? So you can you could study this from the perspective of pathology or epidemiology, but I focus sort of somewhere in the middle, which is how animal behavior drives patterns of disease in the wild. And it sort of falls under two main questions. Uh, you can ask how does host behavior influence infection, right? How does, how does your behavior influence whether or not you're going to be infected with some parasite uh, in the future? You could also ask how being infected by parasites changes your behavior, which we all know that is to be true. We, you know, we change our behavior when we are sick. So these are sort of the two main categories that these types of uh, research questions fall under. So some examples of this could be, you know, how, how does host behavior affect infection? Well, we know social behavior does, if you hang out with a bunch of other hosts, you are more likely to become infected. Uh, your diet can also influence your likelihood of infection. You know, do you eat a broad range of things? Do you eat just very one specific thing that can influence your likelihood of you know, encountering parasites? You can also have behavioral avoidance of pathogens altogether, uh, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit later. This bottom category here, you know, we have uh, examples of medicinal behavior. So when an, an animal is infected with a parasite, it will shift its diet towards foods that fight the parasite rather than just giving it energy. Um, there are examples where animals change their behavior to benefit themselves, to fight the infection. So if you become sick, you become lethargic and spend less energy moving around the world, then you have more energy to fight your infection. There is another really cool example that we'll talk about today, which is where being infected by a parasite changes your behavior, but in a way that benefits the parasite and not you. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those details later. So you can see that these are just six examples of sort of specific questions that people could ask within these two categories, but it gets more complicated than that still. So a lot of people really want to know if you take all of these interactions, how do they actually influence larger scale dynamics? So, you know, we know that a host's behavior can influence whether it becomes infected with the parasite 
we know that the presence of parasites can change the host behavior, but how does that actually influence the things that matter? So things like population dynamics, can a, can a population potentially go extinct because of parasites? Um, community ecology, how does this, you know, understanding the behavior of this host and its parasites influence the ecological community that it lives in? You know, whether or not diseases can jump to humans, those are called zoonotic diseases, and how does it influence the epidemiology of that disease? So really, you know, all of these complex things are really meant to answer some of these questions. Very few researchers actually do those things because it requires a lot of research. You know, have to answer all of these things to address these sort of large scale dynamics. So I'm gonna talk about some sort of specific examples under, uh, under those two categories. So uh, like I said, I'm an animal behaviorist and I became interested in infectious disease about halfway through my PhD. I actually, I, had a totally different plan for my PhD. And then I took a graduate seminar about infectious disease and I heard the word super spreader for the first time. And I thought, wow, that is the most fascinating thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so I wanted to study that. So now we are all very familiar with the term super spreader, I think. Uh, but at the time it seemed novel to me. So, um, you know, infectious disease is a huge field of research, both in ecology, medicine, uh, veterinary medicine. Um, uh, behavior, as you know, you're all experts in this now over this past semester, right? Behavior is a huge field of research, but the joining of the two is not so big. There's not many people that focus specifically on behavior and specifically on disease. Um, there were, in the early 2000s, actually, oddly enough, published in the same year, two books that focused on this topic. So one is by Janice Moore, and this is a very famous book that if you study these types of questions, you've definitely read this book. Uh, it's really interesting and covers a lot of well, the questions that we that we mentioned before and other examples. There's another book published that year called The Behavioral Ecology of Parasites, which has a more ecological view. This has sort of a more of an evolutionary viewpoint. And then this actually talked a little bit about the behavior of parasites, which we'll talk about later uh, today. So then 20 whole years went by before the next book was published on this topic. So just last year, uh, Vanessa Zenwa and her colleagues at the, at the time at University of Georgia published this book um, called Animal Behavior and Parasitism, uh, which is an awesome book. And I'm not just saying that because I'm in it. It's, a, it's an awesome book for lots of reasons. <laughs> but they did invite me to uh, write a chapter on this or in this book, which focused on social behavior and parasite transmission. So the same way that we can, you know, predict whether an individual is likely to become, become sick based on its behavior, can you do the same thing with a social group? Can a social group experience disease outbreaks because of the way that they interact with each other and the way that they move around the world? So that's what that chapter was about, uh, which I'm actually not gonna talk about today, but it is uh, another set of really interesting questions. Uh, so I describe the research we do in our lab as behavioral disease ecology. So we're interested in animal behavior, we're interested in disease ecology and how those two things interact with each other. So we study wildlife infectious diseases, but through the lens of animal behavior. Uh, and we do this in a number of different study systems. So there's sort of multiple ways that you can approach research, right? You can study one study system very deeply and know everything about, you know, well, the fruit fly or the, you know, the species of tick or something like that. That is not the approach I used in my laboratory, which I have been told was maybe not the most adaptive strategy on my part, but I let my students study whatever they're interested in. As long as it is under the, you know, the umbrella of animal behavior and disease, then we're good to go. So we've gone all sorts of places. We study spiders, we study ticks, uh, we've had a student studying frogs, uh, a student studying quail, which was a totally different thing for me. I have a new study in studying uh, snails and their parasites. So we kind of go all over the place. And today I'll talk about three different uh, um, sort of research foci that we have in our lab that all focus on different animals as well. Uh, so our, we have a, a, a pretty big group, uh, depending on what, you know, what, what time of year it is. So we, uh, most of this research is conducted by graduate students. They're really the driving force of research in, in, in laboratories. Um, I'll be talking about some of their research today, but we have a lot of undergraduate research that do this as well. And you know, I like to include them in the whole research process. So they're not just in the lab, you know, washing dishes while the scientists go do the real work. They're actually doing the science in the lab with us. Uh, and even high school students have had work in the lab for, for periods of either a couple of weeks up to a couple of months. And they too were included in the whole process. They designed their own experiments. We, uh, they performed the experiment. I analyzed the data for them and then they helped me write a manuscript and then they, they actually become co-authors 
on papers in the literature, which is pretty exciting. So they get to see what it actually is like to be a scientist. So this is our sort of, you know, a snapshot of some of the people we work with. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is three uh, stories that sort of fall within this framework. So the first story will be about disease avoidance using fruit flies, who I promise are more interesting than you think they are. <laughs> uh, I will talk about parasite manipulation of host behavior, which is a really exciting and almost science fiction-y uh, um, phenomenon. And then we'll finish by talking about the behavior of parasites as it, instead of talking about the behavior of hosts. Okay, so I just finished teaching uh, five weeks of general biology, so to a thousand first year students. And we had a lecture on the immune system and the chapter of the book on the immune system says, the, the first barrier against disease is uh, your outer body layer. So for example, this horseshoe crab has this hard shell. That's its first layer of defense against disease. And then if a pathogen is able to break that first barrier, then you have an immune system inside that can fight that. Well, I happen to disagree with that. I think that the first line of defense against disease is behavior. You don't need a hard shell to protect you from parasites if you don't meet the parasites in the first place. Right, so behavior is really what drives the initial interaction with parasites. And then of course, you know, your skin protects you and then your immune system protects you. But really, I think more people should be focusing on behavior in this realm. So avoidance of disease can arrive, arrive in a couple of ways, right? So you can avoid high risk environments. If there's evidence that you know that other animals are dying, potentially of something infectious, you can avoid that environment. You can avoid other infected hosts. There's lots of you know, sights and sounds and smells that we can use to tell that other people might be sick around us and we can avoid this. I think this is something that we all do whether we know it or not. Uh, or we, you know, even if we do encounter something, whether we know it or not, we can clean ourselves, we can groom ourselves. If you're a bird, you can preen yourselves. So you can use these behavioral defenses against becoming infected with parasites. And there's lots of cool examples throughout the animal kingdom that I'll show before I sort of talk about my own research. So a lot of uh, research comes from primates. Um, and this is research by uh, Dr. Cecile Sarabian. Uh, so she studies primate behavior and is interested in how they, their hygienic behavior. So this was an experiment that they did with um, chimpanzees in Gabon. And here they have, uh, this is a chimp that is interacting with these slices of banana and the food is in a cage, so they must reach inside the cage to grab the food. And I apologize, some of these images will be a little gross, and I realize we just finished lunch, but I tried to keep all the photos of infected animals and parasites out of the talk, but there is some photos of feces. <laughs> so anyway, so they're presenting a banana to this chimpanzee, and one banana is sitting on top of this sponge, which is a, a texture that, a, uh, um, or and also a site that a, a chimpanzee is not familiar with, and then another is sitting on top of a, a rubber replica of a you know, piece of chimpanzee dung. So we'll see what he does. So there's a couple of interesting things there. So uh, Dr. Sarabian here was interested in what order the chimp would pick the food. Um, so for, uh, and of course he picked the food that was on top of the, uh, the sponge first, but then also touched the sponge afterwards to sort of feel the texture, which I think is interesting. Then he knocks the banana off of the feces, grabs it and smells it before he eats it, right? So he, you know, clearly there's a visual cue here saying there's something that, that could make me sick there, but he has this additional sense. He smells it and decides, okay, this is probably safe to eat. This just looks like something I don't want to eat. And so um, this is basically a data from that experiment showing the order in which the chimps chose to eat things. And they always, you know, they chose to eat the foam first and then the uh, food that was on top of feces last. And then they also showed if you paint the feces pink, it sort of arrives somewhere in the middle. So they have some cue that it's gross, but it's pink. So maybe it's not as gross as they think it is. Uh, this is an data from another experiment where they took the food and put it inside a box, which you can see right here. So there's no visual cues here. The chimp knows to reach into this box to get food, but they set the banana on top of one of two things, either a piece of rope that was coiled up or a piece of Play-Doh that was coiled up. So it's the same shape, but the Play-Doh has a texture somewhat similar to feces, right? So the, 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 maybe the chimps are familiar with that. And if the banana was sitting on top of a rope, they ate it about 90% of the time. If the banana was sitting on top of a piece of Play-Doh, they only ate it about half the time. 
because there's something about that texture that hints to them, maybe this is not something I want to get food from. This was another experiment that she did on Japanese macaques where they were, um, she would set up food at, right beside this watering hole and they had um, food on top of three different materials. So actual macaque feces, a rubber model, and just a piece of plastic as a control. And you can see here they're filming um, the, the animal's response. And here what they did is they took a whole bunch of behaviors, like which was the thing that they chose to eat first, how long did it take for them to make the decision? Did they clean themselves after? Did they clean the food and the water behind them? They took all of these values and sort of distilled it down into a single axis, which here they called hygienic behavior. So larger numbers would mean, and the animal is more hygienic, negative numbers mean the animal was less hygienic. And what they did is they tracked each individual after they did this experiment and collected their feces. So they wanted to know, are these animals infected with parasites and is their behavior different because of that? Or it could be the other way around, really. So what they found was there was this negative relationship between hygienic behavior and parasite infection. So the animals that were more hygienic had fewer parasites inside them, which is nice confirmation. You know, being hygienic actually reduces their infection load, which is nice. Um, the females were always more hygienic than males, which you can interpret any way you would like to. <laughs> Uh, but that, that, that uh, trend is stronger in the males than it is in females, which is really interesting. And this was for two, they were looking in um, their uh, feces for two parasites, and these are both parasites that can also infect people. So I thought that was really interesting to show that whether or not you behave hygienically can influence your infection risk. Another really cool example out of Mexico City um, was these researchers who started noticing that these sparrows and finches in Mexico City were picking up cigarette butts. As they, were, as they were foraging for seeds and things like that. Uh, so these birders thought, well, these researchers thought, okay, uh, are they actually like bringing it back to their nest? And if so, what are they doing there? And they found 80 nests, or no, I'm sorry, they, they examined 80 nests and found cigarette filter material in all of them, which is really interesting. So they thought, well, why are they doing this? And they, one of the things they thought is, well, maybe it has an anti-parasitic effects. So they actually, tore apart the nests and looked for ectoparasites, so things like fleas and ticks um, that, could, that can really have a strong effect on baby birds as they're developing. And they found this negative relationship. So the more weight of cigarette butts they had in their nest, the fewer parasites there were present, which is really interesting. I mean, we're not, you know, we don't want to promote, <laughs> I guess we should neither promote smoking nor littering, but it is very interesting that there's been this really fast response that these birds presumably are getting a benefit. Their offspring could survive better because they're lining their nests with this sort of anti-parasitic effect of nicotine, which, you know, was naturally evolved to kill insects. Okay, so we're gonna talk about disease avoidance in these two categories that I brought up. So avoidance of high-risk environments and avoidance of infected hosts. And uh, we're gonna ask the question, do individuals that have a higher disease risk have more hygienic behaviors? And we're gonna use the fascinating fruit fly as a test system. I guess I don't have to be back there anymore. Um, Okay, so most people think of these just as an annoyance that are either in your kitchen or in your compost pile or something like that. Most biologists just think of them as like flying bags of genes because most of what we you know, know about, or not much of what we know about genetics has come from this animal. And it's impo you know, important in both of those aspects, but I actually think it's a really interesting animal from a behavioral and ecological perspective too. So they, uh, they, they, they aggregate on ephemeral food patches, so rotting fruit. It's only there for a brief period of time, so you've got to take advantage of it. And they do all sorts of things there. They feed on the fruit, obviously. They mate with each other on top of this fruit. They lay their eggs in the fruit, and that's what their offspring eat. And males get into these really interesting like boxing matches to fight over uh, access to resources. Um, and they do all this on this fruit. So the way that I think about it is fruit flies really spend their entire lives in a social group. So it's a really cool system to test questions about social behavior, and especially if you're interested in pathogen transmission in social groups, because not only do they live in social groups, they also live in a very microbe-rich environment. You know, they live in rotting fruit. So the likelihood that they encounter pathogens is very high. So I think it's a good system for testing these types of questions. 
So one of those pathogens they can come in contact with is called Metarhizium robertsii, which is just a, um, a fungal pathogen that actually infects hundreds of species of insects. So this is what a dead fruit fly looks like. Um, well, that's interesting, I suppose. This is what a dead fruit fly looks like after it's been exposed to this fungus. So you can see all these green uh, areas on its body. That's basically fungal spores that grew out of its body, and those spores can go infect other flies. So this is just a survival curve that shows that, you know, after if you expose a bunch of flies to this pathogen, after about seven days, half of them are already dead, and about after two weeks, they're all dead. And the way that that works is when a fly becomes uh, exposed to these spores, so if it walks over some spores on the ground, it'll start to groom itself. And they have these really stereotyped grooming behaviors to, to, get, to get the spores off of them. But it's not always successful, and then they start going about their daily business, which usually includes mating a couple of times. So uh, they can transmit the pathogens horizontally, so to the other mating partner when they're mating. If one of them or both of them die, then what happens is the fungus that has penetrated into their body will then grow back outside of their body. And each one of these little like columns is full of thousands of spores that can go infect new flies. So this is sort of the life cycle of that fungus. So I did an experiment where I exposed male and female flies to, the, to this fungus and then measured their um, survival. Their survival. Um, and you don't have to really look at the details here, but the orange lines are the females and the blue lines are the males. And this is a survival curve, so the steeper the curve is, the faster they die. And on all three of these, the females are dying more rapidly. So on average, when you're talking about this pathogen, female flies are more susceptible than the males are. And this is actually somewhat uncommon. In the animal kingdom, when you look on average, males are usually more susceptible to disease than females are, but there's obviously lots of variation, and this is an example where it goes in the other direction. So because of this, we would predict that females would be more hygienic than males if they are more susceptible to disease. So we did an experiment where we looked at the flies in these little observation chambers, uh, and the first question was, do they avoid feeding on contaminated food? So we have these two food patches, a control patch, and a patch that had spores laying on top of it, and we stick some flies in there and see which patch of food they choose to eat on. We followed that up with an experiment where instead of just having a bunch of spores laying around, there was a, a corpse of a fly that had these fungus growing out of it, which is a pretty good indicator of disease risk. So then we said, okay, which one are you gonna choose to feed on? So then we have another experiment. Do flies avoid mating with an infected partner, right? So we would stick a fly into a vial like this. This is the fly we're actually watching. And this is the potentially uh, the infectious mate that it could choose to mate with, right? So we stuck another fly that had been exposed to fung the fungus the day before. We stuck it in there, and then we watched them and then um, recorded whether or not this fly chose to mate with this uh, mating partner. And we did this with both males and females. So this is basically called a one-choice test in animal behavior, where we're not giving this fly any other options of something to mate with. We're basically saying, are you going to mate with this or not? And if you do, how long does it take you to make that decision? So when we're talking about avoiding the contaminated food, um, basically these bars over here, a, a, num a, a higher value suggests that that individual or, uh, chose to feed more on that side. So the controls are on the left and the contaminated is on the right. If the lines are flat, then it basically means they had no preference. So, um, when we were talking about contaminated uh, food patches, there's basically no difference. Even, almost like the, it looks like there's a slight increase for a preference for the contaminated patch. But, but really, they, don't, they didn't avoid the spores, which I found pretty surprising. So neither of them avoided the spores. But if there's an infectious corpse on the food, the females were really good at avoiding it. So they were way less likely to eat on the food. The males did not care. Uh, in fact, we also found that the males were observed mating with the corpses on multiple occasions. <laughs> so their motivations are way off, <laughs> basically. Uh, so they did not avoid, but females did, which is interesting. Okay, so when it comes to, um, oh yeah, avoiding infectious mates, we basically recorded how long it chose for them, how long did it take for them to choose to mate with that individual we presented them. Um, so the males are in blue and the females are in orange. And the, the, this y-axis is like the latency to copulate. So if, if they were to choose to copulate, how long did it take them to make that decision? So if it took them 30 minutes, you would think that maybe they were less motivated to mate, whereas if it took them only two minutes, then they were really motivated 
to choose that mating partner. So males were actually more hesitant to mate with an infectious female than females were, which is interesting. So it took longer for males to make that decision than it did females. But this is a really hard way to interpret it because it takes two to tango, right? It's, the mating is not just based on whether this male or this female wants to mate, both of them have to choose to mate. So it could be that maybe female flies are just less receptive. So these males maybe wanted to mate and the females were sick because they were infected, so they were less likely. So it's really hard to interpret those types of data. So we had, did another experiment where we had the one focal fly and then gave them two options, an infectious fly and a control fly. And in this case, females were more hesitant to, to mate than the males were. And that's very difficult to interpret and I have lots of hand wavy explanations as to why it might be, but we're not really sure. But I think it's important to say, another important note is neither of them were more likely to choose the unexposed partner. So they weren't very good at avoiding mating with an infectious mating partner. Uh, yeah, so females were more susceptible to this fungal disease, but they were only hygienic in, more hygienic in some context, which is sort of like a behavioral ecologist's favorite answer is always like, well, it depends. <laughs> it's hard to say what the actual answer is, but that's what this suggests at least. Okay, so that's how does animal behavior influence infection risk. Now we're going to switch in the other direction and say how do parasites influence the behavior of animals. And one of the most extreme examples is called parasite manipulation. So if you are walking around uh, the world, and actually many places in the world, you could see something like this. And this is an observation. This is a dead ant right here. This is a fungus growing out of that dead ant. And this behavior that the ant is doing, biting onto this blade of grass, is not something that ants typically do. As ants do not leave their colony to go bite onto a blade of grass and then die there. Very uncommon. So this is an observation that people had made all over the world. Uh, there's this, this system exists in Thailand, uh, in Brazil is where a lot of the great research is, and in Florida. This parasite exists that only infects ants, and when it does that, it makes them do really weird ant things that ants don't typically do. So this is a really uh, sort of heavily studied system called uh, cordyceps. Or they changed the name recently to Ophiocordyceps, but a lot of people still call it cordyceps fungus. So this is what that looks like. So basically the idea is that some parasites will change the behavior of their host in a way that will influence their own growth and development or transmission. So it helps their life cycle, even though it's clearly worse for the host. So this is what that looks like. So this ant is biting down onto this blade of grass. It's totally attached. It cannot move. It then dies there and this fungal stalk grows out of its head. And this thing right here will produce thousands of spores, hundreds of thousands of spores that can fall down the canopy and infect new ants. So the way that whole system works is you have ants inside their nest behaving like ants normally do. Foragers will leave. Uh, to go uh, to, you know, to, to just forage for food like they, like, they, like they typically would. They become exposed to spores. They will continue to hang out in the nest and do their thing for a couple of days, at which point they leave the nest, oftentimes at a different time of day than they typically do. They'll crawl up a piece of vegetation, crawl out onto the underside of a leaf, and then bite down into the central leaf vein. And they bite so hard that their muscles atrophy, and they are stuck there until they die. And that's when this fungus grows out. So it's pretty morbid and totally seems like invasion of the body snatchers. Uh, but this is, is I mean, like I said, this literally happens in Gainesville. This parasite exists in Gainesville. Um, so this is the life cycle of that parasite. Uh, after this, uh, the fungal body grows out of the ant, it'll rain spores down, oftentimes onto its other workers in its colony. They become exposed and then go back into their nest and this cycle continues. Pretty awesome, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Uh, okay, so researchers wanted to know, well, how are they doing? Is it a chemical thing? Do they release a neurotransmitter or something? And that is how some parasites affect their host. But in this example, someone uh, took some sections, like cross sections of an ant's head. So this is its mandible right here. Uh, its eye would be up there. Oh boy. Its eye would be right here. Um, so they did some cross sections and they found this, and that's actually hyphae. So the, 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 basically the roots of the fungus are growing through this ant's body. Uh, through its head. So people thought, well, maybe it's controlling its brain. Uh, so people thought, so a, a group of researchers uh, did this uh, experiment where they took a whole bunch of cross sections and then used a computer model to build a 3D model. So each of these larger structures right here 
are muscle fibers in the ant, and all of these are the fungus. So this is them. So this is a 3D model they constructed of the muscle. And then the yellow is the fungus that grows around the muscle. So they found that it actually grows around the ant's muscles and not its brain. So it might not actually be brain control. It's sort of puppeting, almost like a marionette, like moving, uh, somehow influencing the muscles to make the ant, you know, do the bidding of this parasite. So it's a really interesting system and it's been really studied in depth, but we don't know the degree to which this happens in other sort of host parasite systems. So I'm very interested in spiders. Uh, I, you know, and uh, I think we know very little about, you know, their, their ecology, depending on what your perspective uh, is. So so I was studying spiders and I knew that they also had fungal pathogens and I wanted to know if this was, was happening in spiders as well. And in doing so, we realized we do not know very much, we don't, we don't know very much about the, the parasites of spiders at all. So we thought, okay, we, gotta, we wanted to do step five, we got to step all the way back and do step one and say, what are the parasites that affect spiders? Uh, and there are a lot. So these are all things that I found in Gainesville. So this is a fungal parasite growing out of a spider. This is a jumping spider that, you know, the little green ones that have, have an orange dot on their head. Uh, that is this, but all of these structures are, are fungal structures. This is a, a parasitoid wasp larva. So this is a wasp that lays its eggs, its egg onto a spider, which grows into a little larva and drinks the spider's blood. And then eventually it grows large enough that it just eats the whole spider. This is a pathogen, or a parasitic worm um, that this spider fell into a pitfall trap. It fell into some ethanol, and then this worm emerged from it. And you can see this whole thing right here is this a single worm that was inside the spider. So basically filled its whole body cavity. Super gross. Uh, and <laughs> so they, there are a lot of parasites that affect spiders. We just know very little about them. Uh, so this was the first specimen that I found, and I found it in my backyard right off of Newberry Road. Um, and this is that jumping spider that's infected with this fungus. So each one of these stalks is a fungal structure. So this is what it looks like front on. Each one of these is producing thousands of spores. So you can sort of zoom in a little bit more and it has all these little structures that, you know, if the wind were to blow on it or if a rain drop were to hit it or if something bumped into it, all these spores could fly out and potentially inf inf infect other spiders. So before we can test whether or not, you know, this fungus is controlling its behavior and, and, you know, influencing its muscles, we still have a lot of work to do. But one thing that we have noticed just observationally is when we find these spiders, they're almost always on the undersides of leaves. Uh, and almost always they have this like layer of silk right under them. And this is not something that spiders typically do. This is the way that spiders, you know, and when they're going to lay an egg case, they'll often make like a little mat of silk lay their eggs in it and then uh, cover it with silk. So this is sort of like step one in the process of laying an egg case, but they're not laying an egg case. They kind of stick onto the mat of silk and then they stick there and then they die. And that's when the fungus grows out of them. So a couple of us has been, have been referring this, uh, to this as like their deathbed behavior. So they're laying down a layer of silk that's not gonna benefit the spider at all. It's gonna benefit the fungus because once this fungus grows out of its body, you know, it doesn't want its host to just fall off of the leaf, right? So, or it doesn't want to be on the top of the leaf because if the fungus, if the fungi, the spores fall off, it's just going to land on the top of the leaf and it's never going to infect anyone. So if it's on the bottom of a leaf, it can rain down the canopy and potentially hit another spider. So this could be a case where the spider's behavior is being manipulated to benefit the parasite. And hopefully we'll know the answer to that question in a couple of years, <laughs> basically. Um, but in doing, in doing this research, we realized, you know, we know very little about this, the parasites of spiders. So I started this research collection called the Spider Parasite Digital Research Collection, or SPIDER. Uh, and uh, we collect, um, we, yeah, we collect parasites or collect spiders, look for parasites inside them. And then we have, have this whole research collection devoted just to that single topic. And we happened to start this in 2019 and then realized it was going to be really hard to, to, you know, to be doing research in 2020. So I went on Twitter and said, hello, we're starting this research collection. If you've ever seen anything like this in the field, you know, a spider with fungus on it or, or mites or, you know, parasitic worms, and you want to get rid of it, send it to us and we'll put it in this collection and we'll pay for the shipping. Uh, so we actually had a lot of people volunteer. It's sort of become like a community science um, project and we get uh, specimens from all over the country. It's really cool. Okay, so this is the third part of the talk. I have not been keeping track of time, so I hope it's still okay. 
Okay, cool. Okay, so the last part of the talk is we're going to talk about, instead of talking about the behavior of hosts and how that interacts with parasites, we're going to talk about the behavior of parasites. And we're going to focus on this little creature that everyone hates. This is a lone star tick. And this is research that I did with a former graduate student who is now, she was a, re, a master's student here and now she's a postdoc or a PhD student at North Carolina State. So the reason, you know, why, do, why would people study the, parasite, uh, the behavior of parasites? For a lot of parasites, they find their hosts with behavior. You know, when we think about pathogens like viruses or, or bacteria, you know, a host is usually sneezing it into the environment or, you know, it's coming out, you eat it and then it comes out the other end and that's how it infects other hosts. But some parasites are large, you know, somewhat large bodied animals, multicellular animals that have to find their hosts. So they have free living stages where they're moving around the environment. Like um, these are mites, uh, juvenile mites that have to find their hosts. Uh, and they literally have to walk around the environment, avoid being eaten by predators. They have to find potential hosts. So they're really behaving like animals, even though we just think of them as parasites. And even these, so these are trematodes, which are um, uh, a group of parasites that infect all sorts of aquatic animals. Uh, marshlands, for example, are full of animals that are infected with trematodes. And their life cycle usually can be something like it has to infect a snail and then has to leave the snail and infect something like a frog. And then the frog will get eaten by a bird and that's where it completes its life cycle. Sometimes it has to go through multiple species of snail and then a crab and then another animal and then a bird to complete its life cycle. So there's all these steps where it has to move and it's behaving. It's swimming around the environment. It's you know avoiding things, attracted to things. It's somewhat simple, but it still has behavior. We just don't really think about it like that. So I think it's especially important if you think about ticks as parasites, that studying the behavior of ticks is really important. And I think of this for a couple of reasons. The transmission of tick-borne diseases is dependent on the tick's behavior. It's also dependent on your behavior because you have to find, you know, get hit with a tick and then not pick it off. But the tick has to, be, has to find a host, right? Uh, and it does this with a behavior called questing, which we'll talk about uh, in a second. Ticks are also the number one uh, vector for the diversity of pathogens they can transmit to humans. So they're not the, they're not the, wonder, they're not the number one transmitter of parasites or pathogens because that, um, that crown is worn by the mosquitoes. But ticks uh, transmit a greater diversity of pathogens to humans than any other group of parasites. They find their host by this behavior called questing, which is what this tick is doing over in the corner here. So basically a tick that is ready to drink some blood will walk up a piece of vegetation and it holds its arms out like this. And it just waits there for sometimes very long periods of time. It's waiting for an animal to walk by like a mammal or a reptile, depending on what type of tick it is. And when the mammal walks by, it has to latch on, find a safe spot and uh, find a place to feed before it gets picked off. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a behavioral strategy. And we know from other systems like the Lyme disease system that the questing behavior can be influenced by pathogen infection. So ticks that have Lyme disease behave differently than ticks that don't have Lyme disease. So we wanted to ask these three questions. Well, my student really did this. She wanted to know, does questing behavior differ between different habitats that you might find ticks in? Does questing behavior differ between different populations of ticks? And how does pathogen infection affect questing behavior? So we were studying uh, this animal that nobody likes uh, called the lone star tick, which is uh, Amblyoma americanum, uh, which is uh, moving it. So this is what its life cycle looks like. So they start out very, very small. Um, then they molt into nymphs and then they can molt into uh, adult females or, or males. The females have this white sort of yellow spot on the, on the center of their back, which makes them really easy to identify. They're pretty big pretty large bodied tick, and their, their range is expanding across the country. So they, were usually, they originally were found only in the Southeast. In 2016, this is what their range looked like. In 2023, their range is touching almost the West Coast. They're really expanding all over the place, which makes them a really important system to, to study. You know, does the behavior of a tick in Georgia differ from the behavior of a tick in Pennsylvania or Ohio or something like that? So we should be studying their behavior. Um, they also carry several disease-causing pathogens, including Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and this other thing called Rickettsia amblyommatis, which is a bacteria that is re related to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but is pretty emerging, so we don't really know much about it. It often gets misdiagnosed as Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but it's a little bit less severe. 
Um, so we're, we're not really sure how it could be interacting with that pathogen, or if they're co-infected, what could happen? Are you less likely to get the disease if you have this uh, bacteria first? We don't really know. So that's the one that she was interested in studying. So this is how you go out and collect ticks, or it's one of the ways that you can. This is called dragging or flagging for ticks. So this is my uh, former student, Elise Richardson. Uh, so you have this canvas flag with two ropes attached to it, and you just walk through the forest and drag it behind you. And you let it you know, go over vegetation and in the leaf litter, and you walk for 10 meters or so. And then you pick it up like this, and you count all of the ticks on it. So if it's an adult tick, it's really easy to find. And you just pick it up, and you put it into a vial, and you take it back to the laboratory. But sometimes you can get what's called a tick bomb, which are juvenile ticks that just hatched out of their egg case. And there could be you know, dozens to over 100 all sitting on one leaf. And if you bump over them with this thing, it just is covered in ticks. And that's no fun. Uh, unless that's what you're looking for, in which case then it's great. But yeah, so collecting for ticks is, is, is a dangerous job because you, you're very likely to get tick bites while doing this. Uh, okay, so Elise did this. Um, she collected ticks and then brought them back to the lab and wanted to study their questing behavior. And the way that you do that is you put them into a box and in the box there's a wooden dowel rod in the middle. You put the tick in the bottom and then see if it goes on a quest. And then you can measure things like how high was did it uh, go before it stopped and did the stereotypical that behavior. Um, you can measure the height and then you can measure the duration of the, that, the questing behavior. And she did this three times across three different days for each of the ticks that she collected just to, you know, if you got a tick on an off day, maybe it will behave differently in the next two days. So she measured them each three times. And she collected them in two different habitats in Ordway Swisher Biological Station. Uh, she collected them from xeric hammocks, which are, you know, pretty open understory, usually only one species or a few species of trees with a shorter canopy, um, pretty, you know, high sunlight, and these are often like sloping towards bodies of water. She also collected ticks in the successional hardwood, which looks very different, right? So a lot more understory, you know, complexity. There's many different species of different ages um, and a lot more leaf litter. So potentially a lot more opportunities to find ticks. So she was going to then bring these ticks back to the laboratory and study their behavior. But this was in April of 2020. So there was no laboratory to go back to. So she took them to her back porch. So I'm very proud of the fact that she was very resilient and wanted to continue her research, even though it was a very confusing time and scary time. So she was testing the behavior of ticks on her on her back patio in her experiment. So that's where she did the first part of the experiment. Then she froze all the ticks and we were able to look for, par for pathogens inside them later when we got back to the lab. So what she found was that ticks that were collected in the xeric hammock, this much more open habitat, spent two and a half times longer questing than the ticks that were collected in the successional hardwood. The way that I interpret this is if you live in a habitat like this, you know, you're less likely to find a really good spot to perch to, to go on a quest. So if you find one, you should really take advantage of that opportunity and quest for longer periods of time. Whereas if you come from here, you can go on a quest anytime you want. So you just spend less time on each of those uh, questing bouts. But the cool thing is she wasn't testing them in those habitats. She brought them back to her porch. So there was something ingrained inside the ticks based on where they were born that influenced their behavior. And you know, these were sometimes only like a couple hundred yards apart. So they weren't even different populations or anything like that. So that's pretty cool. Then she wanted to go up in scale. Okay, what about different populations of ticks? Do ticks you know, from the city differ from ticks uh, from more rural areas? So she collected ticks from three different parks in Gainesville and then collected t uh, the, the ticks from Ordway Swisher uh, which is about 40 kilometers away. So very unlikely that this is the same population. So what she found was that the ticks collected at Ordway, so the more rural sites, quested um, about seven to 12 centimeters higher than the ticks from Gainesville. So these three over here were the three places she collected in Gainesville. And then OSBS over here had a much higher uh, height of questing behavior compared to the other ones. Don't really know how to interpret this. You know, it could be that there's just a different set of host species out here than there is in Gainesville. So it's better to go a little bit higher up in the canopy so you interact with deer or other large bodied mammals. Whereas in Gainesville, you're mostly getting smaller mammals and probably pets too. Um, don't really know. <laughs> That's one of those experiments that makes more questions than answers. So then she wanted to know how does, 
carrying that bacterial uh, symbiont, that pathogen, affect the tick's behavior? Well, she first found that um, ticks, uh, adult ticks were more likely to be infected than nymphs, which makes sense because they've you know, bitten more hosts and been able to pick up the pathogen from other hosts uh, more likely or more readily. But if you zoom in on the nymphs, which are the, on the other half over here, this, is, this graph is showing the questing duration for each of the quests that the ticks went on. And blue is the ones that are uninfected, orange is the infected. So for adults, there was no difference. If the adults are infected, their behavior doesn't change. But when the nymphs were carrying this infection, they quested uh, for shorter durations, about one and a half times shorter compared to uninfected juveniles. Again, we have no idea why this is. Are, do they actually feel ill and they're changing their behavior because of that? Is it a manipulation where the bacteria is doing something to make them change their behavior? We really have no idea, but would love to follow up with other stuff. So they sort of the take home messages from that part of the talk are that ticks quested for longer periods in habitats with a more open understory. Ticks from rural sites quested at higher locations and infection with this bacteria was associated with a shorter questing duration, but only in juveniles. So one of these, you know, things where more questions than answers were brought up, but I would love for a student to come do more research in here. And just another example of sort of to sum the whole talk up that, you know, studying behavior and parasitology in the same research lab as opposed to in different places is important from all different perspectives, from the perspective of the parasite, from the perspective of the host, but then in the perfect world, we'll be studying all of these and how they interact with each other. So I'll hopefully do that sometime in the next number of decades, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, okay, so this, I just wanted to show off sort of uh, another snapshot of our research group and all the people that have worked on some of the stuff that I got to present today. Um, and then I wanted to say that if you are really interested in the, the spider collection that we talked about, all of our, all of our photographs and, and all of our data are, are online for free. We made a, a, a collection. Um, so all the information is freely available on the internet. It's not just like stowed away in our lab. And because it's sort of a community driven project, we started a foundation account so people can donate uh, money that really, the, I mean, the money really goes to support student research. So it's a really direct way of supporting undergraduates that um, wouldn't be able to, you know, just volunteer their time to work in a lab. So they actually get paid to work in our lab. So if you're interested in that, we can talk about that too. But thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Okay, any just questions? Thank you. Fascinating. It makes me want to breathe only through my nose and keep my mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, everyone feels a little bit itchier now. Yeah. So um, the observation where you found the bird nests that incorporated cigarette butts to offer more protection. Um, do you have any hypothesis on how the birds figured that out beyond natural selection? That's a great question. The order of operations is really interesting there. I would, if I had to guess, you know, clearly they didn't know that there was something in the cigarette butt that would provide protection. My guess is that incorporating something nice and fluffy into your nest is nice as a nice way to rear your young and maybe it has better insulation and things like that. So they found something nice and fluffy and it just so happened that it had this huge benefit. And it's hard to say if, the, if, the, if it was a rapid enough response that those ones actually had better offspring. And you know, that is how natural selection works. It's hard to say if that's actually what's happening or if it's just that, you know, maybe it's a learned behavior. We don't really know. Or they could smell. They can say, yeah, they might be able to sense it out. It's true. Oh, okay. I have a question here on chat. Uh, so when the, was it macaw, macaques were carrying parasites, they were more hygienic or was it the other way around? Uh, the more hygienic uh, macaques were, had fewer parasites. So that would suggest that their hygienic behavior works, basically. It's like a confirmation of the assumption. What about the uh, interrelationship of species uh, and I'm thinking particularly about cleaning, where one, one species helps to clean another uh, parasites. Yes, that's great. So grooming, yeah, grooming behavior is interesting. We didn't even talk about allogrooming, which is sort of an intermediate between the grooming that I talked about and the interspecies grooming you're talking about. So individuals groom each other to remove parasites, which is really important in primates. So, you know, it's like how they build their social structures, basically, is, is grooming each other. But there's some 
you know, groups of species where one species will pick ectoparasites off the other. So like cleaner shrimp on coral reefs will, will pick ectoparasites off of fish. And for that, the fish doesn't eat them. So it's a nice mutualism. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know, that's a good question. There's, it, it's not, it hasn't evolved many times, like interspecific grooming. The, the examples where it has happened have been very successful and we, you know, they become very prominent. For example, the, the cleaner fish or uh, the, um, is it ox peckers that pick, um, you know, ectoparasites off of mammals. So they're very successful, but I, you know, there's not, I, I've never seen like a comparative analysis to show like how common it is across you know, the animal kingdom. I know that there was recently a video posted online, this is in the past couple of years, where someone proposed that they had on multiple game cameras found white-tailed deer having, um, I think it was possums, pick ticks off of them. And I mean, the video is really, it really looks like that's what's happening. The white-tailed deer is standing, but the possum is sitting on a fence and the deer is just holding its head up to it. And you can see the possum grooming it, which would be a totally new observation. But the steps of, that would be required for that to happen is really interesting. Yeah, I don't know, that's very cool though. You mentioned quail and I have an observation and a question. 30 years ago in Citrus County where I lived, we were in a fairly uh, unpopulated area, a uh, maximum of one house per acre, and we seemed to have a lot of uh, ten years ago and, and five years ago, no quail seen anywhere. Is there a, a disease running through the quail? Uh, that's a good, so we were studying quail. These, the, the quail that I showed was a California quail. Um, I, or, what are, the ones in Florida, are they, Bob White, is that what we have? Right, yeah. I don't know. I, there, I, we, I have ornithology leaning colleagues that might have a better answer to that, um, but I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Okay, let's go to John Reiskind if you'd like to unmute. You need to unmute, John. You're not unmuted. Oh, yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, a couple of questions. First of all, to say okay, something good about a possum is great. Okay, you're uh, unmuted, but we don't hear you. Well, I'm unmuted. Maybe chat. Maybe type it in chat. We'll come back to you. We could. We couldn't hear you, John. Even though you were unmuted, we could not hear you. So there we go. Okay. Oh, everyone else can hear him. That's weird. All right. Well, I, I see that on Zoom, y'all can hear them, but I apologize. I wonder if we've gone back to our problem of a couple of weeks ago. Let's go ahead and go back here to the Oak Room. Okay, um, somebody else? You can, if you can remember, we'll go collecting spiders again sometime and you can ask me then. <laughs> uh, a, a puzzle, some ticks, when they bite humans, the humans are alert, become allergic to beef. What's the advantage to the parasite to the tick in doing something like that it just seems weird to me great yeah that's a good question and a very weird one because that allergy the lone star tick is one of the ticks that causes that um which i think of as just like the a hunter's worst nightmare right you know they're the ones that are more likely to be out in the field anyway and they become allergic to red meat as you know it's sad but <laughs> uh so that's actually an allergy to a protein that, that, the, that the tick picks up from a previous host. So the tick only feeds on, uh, on one host. It'll take a blood meal and then it goes away and it can sometimes you know, go all winter uh, you know, before it molts into another life stage and then goes and finds another host. So it's only gonna bite you know, a rabbit or a, a mouse or something before it bites you. But for some reason, in some cases, that tick picks up some protein from the host before it and I don't know if it gets stored in its salivary glands or, or something like that, but it somehow gets incorporated into that tick. So when it bites you, the, the, the next host, which is you, develops an allergy to the protein. So it's actually not a parasite. It's a weird protein thing, which I understand way less than parasites. But yeah, that's sad. That's weird. I, I tried a different setting. John, you want to try again? Yeah, good. Uh, first of all, it's nice to hear something nice about a possum. Can you hear me? Any others here? <laughs> 
You can't I, hear I'm me. I'm sorry, we can't hear you, John. It's, okay. it's, there's something amok. Uh, yeah. Can you type it into uh, chat? I'll try. I'll try. Okay. <laughs> any other, any other uh, questions? By definition. Oh, okay. Any other uh, comments or questions? Mm. Okay, well, um, <laughs> you can email him. <laughs> I can talk to John. So when again. The, yeah, oh, thanks, okay. John. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, and um, we appreciate your uh, contribution, your talk. Thanks so much thanks for coming. Oh, that's, yeah. Great talk. Okay. And it would have to be John. Of course. No, sorry, John. If we're not him, you know, being too.